Good morning, church. This, uh, this is a wonderful sound to hear in the morning. Everybody greeting everyone. Excited to, to see everyone this morning. I don't know about you, but if you woke up and you looked outside and you saw all the fresh snow, maybe a couple bunny tracks out there, right? All the fresh snow covered up all the dirty snow and all of that and the sun out. Ah, just gorgeous, gorgeous. It was a, it was a good way to wake up. Um, if you haven't, uh, we do have communion cups in the back in two baskets. So for our guests and our visitors, if you need them, they are in the back. Um, you can grab them at this time. And then also before our, our uh, communion time, we'll have another reminder. Uh, all right. There is uh, quite a bit of activities going on. want everybody to be uh, mindful of that. Um, the first thing is, next Sunday, we've got a couple things going on. Next Sunday, immediately following service, there is a, um, a, a meeting that will be happening. Let me just read it. The elders would like everyone to plan to, uh, on being at our congregational meeting immediately following uh, our Sunday morning worship service. That's next Sunday, January 29th. Uh, we'll try to keep it under uh, to 15 minutes, but we have some exciting, important information about our growing congregation, and we want to share with everyone. So if you uh, uh, make it a point to, to be here, it'll be good for us to, to be here together, um, uh, supporting our elders in the work that they're doing. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, next Sunday evening, Brett Pricillo will be uh, starting our, uh, we'll be giving a stronger family series lesson. It's going to be at six o'clock. The title is The War for Our Teens, so don't miss out on that lesson. Um, it's one you won't soon forget. Uh, Saturday, March 4th, we're already talking about March. February is a short month. January is close to being over. It's hard to believe March is right around the corner, but March 4th, um, uh, Denny Petrillo will be doing a lesson on how we got the Bible. That's going to be Saturday. Uh, let's see, I got one more note here. The January 28th, I did these out of order. I was going to try to do the next Saturday. Um, there is the aspiring teachers uh, class for teachers. Um, anyone interested in developing a new gift are invited to attend the teacher workshop by Kathy Petrillo uh, and Lisa uh, Ripperton. I, I'm going to say that. I said that absolutely correct. Uh, please make plans to attend. There is a sign-up sheet in the back to, uh, for food, to bring food. So if you're able to, you can go ahead and do that. We read in uh, Acts chapter uh, 5 today, or no, Acts chapter 6 today, that they pointed some men to make food. So you guys, it's very much okay and biblical for you to go back there and sign up and bring food as well. I said that because I mentioned that to Derek and he laughed. He thought that was funny. Uh, but it is true. You can, you can bring some food. Uh, there's also a sign-up sheet in the back for, for men to lead devotional talks on Wednesday nights. This Wednesday, Derek will be leading a, a devotional time for us. So hopefully you get an opportunity to, one, sign up, two, go back there, see who's, who's teaching and encourage them, um, but also be excited to hear some words from different folks uh, in our congregation as they share God's word. Uh, with us. So uh, men, if you would like to, young men, if you'd like to, there's a sign-up sheet in the back. Go ahead and do that. Uh, we'll, we'll all be blessed by it. Finally, no carrying cards tomorrow, and uh, we are excited to have you here this morning. Uh, we'll pray for our kids, our teens, uh, as this area is empty. They're coming back from Cheyenne today. Uh, tonight, there is... Um, 
the, the there's SYD tonight. Is that still going on? Yep. SYD tonight, and it is at Inglewood. All right. So uh, a lot of the kids will be there for SYD tonight at Inglewood. Uh, let's go to the God in prayer as we begin our worship together. Holy Father, great is your name. You have brought us here, and we thank you for that. You have uh, blessed the people here to, to be encouraged, to be of encouragement, and to be a light in this area uh, that, that is from you. And uh, Father, we thank you for that. We pray that you give us the things and we are able to open our eyes to see how you have given us the things that we need every day. We thank you for providing what is required every day. Be with us now during this time of worship. Be with us that, uh, that the enemy's attacks, whatever they might be, Father, that they might be laid aside, that we might be able to be refreshed and renewed and encouraged by the worship with one another. I pray that that this worship is a time where we're able to commune with you in your spirit and we're able to see how you are, Emmanuel, that you are with us. Guide us now in our worship. May it be pleasing and may it be a joyful time uh, together. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everyone. Let us lift up our voices and praise God today, especially with our team being gone. Let's make up for their voices. Hosanna. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Singing 
When participating in the Lord's Supper, Scriptures tells us that we need to make three specific looks. We need to look backward, we need to look forward, and we need to look inward. Starting in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, it says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This is the cup. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The Lord's Supper is a memorial remembering Jesus' life, his death, and his resurrection. When we partake of the Lord's Supper, we should remember these things. A few examples looking back. Using our imaginations, we can sit in the gloom of Gethsemane's garden, put ourselves in the agony that our Savior experienced as he committed to the cross. We can stand in the developing riot as we hear, crucify him, crucify him, echoing through the praetorium. We can listen to Jesus on top of Golgotha as he gasps for air and says, it is finished. But we need to look back. Continuing on in verse 26, it says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We also need to look forward. By participating in the Lord's Supper, we proclaim his death, and we are to do so until he returns. Looking forward, we could see the most glorious event on the horizon. Jesus descending mightily from the heavens through the clouds, shining in God's triumph. Every eye in the world on him, the trumpet of God sounding across the earth. And Jesus saying, well done, my good and faithful servant. Continuing on, though, in verse 28, it says, But a man must examine himself. And in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So while looking back and looking forward, we then need to turn and look inward. We should search our hearts in preparation of taking the Lord's Supper. Examine ourselves and make sure we're doing it in a worthy manner. For it's not by our own merits that we have the privilege to be here, but by the grace of God through the accepted invitation. We participate in the Lord's Supper when we're baptized and committed believers who look backward, who look forward, and who look inward. This look can help us prepare our minds. So let's do that as we pray for the bread. Dear Father, O oh God, you know our heart. Please try us. You know our thoughts. And see if there's any wicked in us and lead us in the way of the everlasting through your son who suffered and died for us. Help us to remember his life, those he healed, the examples of love that he gave, and the devotion to you and your will. May you bless this bread as we partake of it. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Let us say a prayer for the bud. Oh God, we ask in the name of your son, Jesus, to bless and sanctify this fruit of the cup for all the souls who partake of it, that we may drink of this cup in remembrance of your plan and the sacrifice and salvation we have through your son. And may this be 
a time in which we loudly witness to the world that we believe and we are followers of yours. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At the conclusion of the Lord's Supper, we have the opportunity to uh, conveniently give back, to give to the church and to the works. There are two things I want to think about this morning as we look at giving. In the Old Testament, there was five uh, main areas reasons for offerings. Of those, the majority of them are related to sin, which are covered for us through Jesus and his sacrifice. But there are two that I think can kind of be parallel to what we do today. Burnt offerings were done for sin, but also to sow devotion to God and to honor him. And grain offerings were another one that was done to show devotion and to honor God. This morning as we give, we do so to show the same things, that we're devoted to him and that we want to honor him out of what we have. But we want to do so out of sacrifice, which is the second thing. We want to, it shows our faith. When you give out of sacrifice, not from your abundance, it shows you know he will provide, he will take care of you. In 2 Samuel 24, 24, David, when looking for a sacrifice, was offered up the meat for free. And he said, I will not offer to God a sacrifice in which cost me nothing. So remember that this morning, as we go to God to prayer, and we give from our hearts everything that already belongs to him anyway. Let's pray. Lord, you blessed us so abundantly. You give to us always. You take care of us. You continually think about what our needs are and how to provide for them. You also give us to, the opportunity to enjoy many things that are excess of need, things that are, are, are fun and more than the basic necessities. And we thank you for that. We pray that this morning, as we give, we will give out of sacrifice, and in a manner that is pleasing to you, we will give from our heart in full devotion to you, to honor you, and that you can use these funds to benefit your kingdom. We thank you for your love, Lord, and in your son's holy name we pray, amen. please stand for this next song. This will be the song before our scripture reading followed by our lesson for today. I am resolved. <clears throat> I am resolved no longer to linger charmed by the world's delight. Things that are to enter the king. 
leaving the paths of sin. Friends may oppose me, foes may beset me, still will I enter in. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad. Our scripture reading today will come from 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2, we'll read verses 1 through 6. <clears throat> Verse 1. First of all, then I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men, for kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a trait tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. For there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. Good morning, everybody. It's good to see your faces. Uh, it's good to be here uh, worshiping you again, and uh, I'm thankful to be here this morning. I thank you for all your prayers uh, on my behalf. Um, also want to, uh, at this time, just uh, thank everyone with you that have small children. Uh, I know that as you're here with small children, you're trying to work with them, you're trying to train them and you're trying to teach them to, to be here and sometimes they're uh, you know they can be loud they can be um, you know a little bit difficult to uh, always have in in manage um, but I want you to know that there are not any judging eyes just blessed ears uh, when we are here we're thankful that you are here with your small ones and we don't want you to feel uh, bad at all that you have here with your small kids we love to hear them uh, even sometimes the cries we love to hear. So please uh, know that you're welcome here and you're, we're blessed to have you here with us. Paul said to the church at Philippi, for to me to live is, church, Christ. Right? For to me to live is Christ. And I think we, we, you know, we could spend a lot of time trying to figure out all the nuances to what that might mean and what it does mean. We can look further into chapter 2, and Paul's talking to the church about how they are to have this attitude, as Christ did in himself, that he was someone who did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant. And so part of that idea of living, for me to live is Christ, Paul would say that it was to empty himself of himself and not regard the things that he had as a person to be that which is to be held on, but to empty himself of self. Earlier in chapter 2 there in Philippians, Paul is telling the church that do not regard yourself as more important than others. You know, do not be self-conceited. Do not look to self as the person who is number one. And we fight that in our culture today. We fight that idea in our culture today, and specifically the American culture, because this is not necessarily a worldly culture, uh, by talking about the entirety of the world. But our American culture, it is, we are influenced with the idea. Who is number one in the American culture? We are. We are, ourselves are first and foremost. We are to look to ourselves. And so a lot of what is changing over this time too in this landscape that we're living in is we are then ruled by our emotions. We are ruled by our emotions. We have a, in, in our culture now, we are responding, uh, reacting in a way that we, we're not trying to be 
logical and reasonable in our thoughts. We're just allowing our emotions, right or wrong, to dictate what our life is and what our life is about and what is right. What is right? Have you ever been wrong in a reaction emotionally? There's probably not one person in here that would say, me, never. I've always been right with my emotions and how I react to it. There's probably not one of us who could do that, right? We've, we've reacted in such a way, we've reacted never, maybe in anger, maybe in jealousy. And then don't need to find out, oh, sorry, that's probably not the way I should have reacted. Our emotions are given to us by God for a reason. But just like a lot of other things that God blesses us with, they can ultimately be used in a wrong manner. And what our culture has taught us today is our emotions then rule our lives. And, we're, and then ultimately, day to day, have you ever had your emotions be up one day and down the next day and then up the one day and then down the next day again? Your emotions ever carried you on a roller coaster? How consistent does that make your life? Does it make it a life of contentment? Does it make it a life of reason? Does it make it a life where you're continually excited about what's going to happen each day and in, in, in the week that's ahead? Our emotions, if we continue to allow them to dictate our lives, can rule our lives. And then we can get to a point where we are upset or excited at a drop of a hat. And we respond in such a way. When Paul says, for to me to live is Christ, I don't think he had that in mind. Because he goes on to say that we must empty ourselves. Do not regard ourselves as more important than others. He says, do not merely look at your own interests, but look out for the interests of others. And oftentimes, our emotions are not interested in others. Our emotions are interested in ourselves. We have to ask ourselves, how important is our relationship to God? What is the most important thing in this world to us? What does God think the most important thing is? I believe that we can find out through looking through God's word that the most important thing that God thinks is or the most important thing that God thinks is a relationship with him. That's what God thinks is the most important thing. How do I know this? Why do we think this? Because God sent his son to die on the cross so that we could have a relationship with him. How important does God think a relationship is with him? He did everything that he could in order for that to happen. We're going to look at some words that are tied to Christ over the next couple of weeks here, probably just this week and then maybe uh, two more weeks after that. Prepositions that we have, we find throughout scriptures that have Christ in it. The first thing that I want us to look at this morning is through Christ. Through Christ. If you've ever not ever done a study of these words together, go and look in the New Testament and look up these two words together, through Christ, and you're going to find a lot more tied to these two words than just what we're going to cover today. Through Christ. What does it mean for me to live is Christ? I think through these words, we can establish how much or how important our life is tied to God through Christ. The first verse that we might think of, it comes to us from John 14, verse 6. Right? This is a verse that we all know, and we have the idea of through. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but or except through me, or some of your translations might say by me. By me. The same word there, by, is the same idea as through me. We often look at this passage with the idea of the exclusiveness of it, 
right? There is no other way that we can come to God than through Christ. And that's accurate. That's correct. But I want to offer just a slightly different perspective here with this idea of what Jesus is saying here. He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Okay, well, so there's no other way that we can get to God than through Christ. Okay, yes, you're right. But here is the reason. Christ is the only one that is able to get us to God. See, it's a slightly different look at it. He is the only one that is able to get us to God. That previous passage there in 1 Timothy 1 through 6, it says he is the mediator. He is the mediator between God and man. How much does God want to have a relationship with us? He sent his son so that he would be the mediator because he is going to be the only means, the only one who is able to bring us to God. So then how important is our relationship to Christ? If our relationship to God is something that is truly important to us, then we've got to, of course, seek out Christ. And that's why Paul says, for to me to live is Christ. Because he wants to be with God. He wants to be with God. So it's through Christ, as we know, that is the way that we are able to be with God, but it's because he's the only one able. That's why in Revelation you have all these things talking about who is going to be able to open up these seals? Who is able to be the one who's going to be providing us redemption? It is only through Jesus Christ. So I want to take this idea, then I want us to bring, it, bring us to Romans chapter 5. If you want to be turning to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. And I want to point out all the time that Paul uses the word through with respect to Christ. And these are foundational to our life. These are foundational to our life that should give us a foundation in which our emotions can then ride above. So look at, with me at Romans chapter 5, verse 1. It says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So the first thing that we have here through Christ is that we have peace. We have peace. And notice what he goes on to say through whom we also have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand, which I'm going to get to in just a second. And we exalt or we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So now that we have peace, I want us to notice what Paul says then we can go on to do. Because this is where then foundational, if we have this foundation underneath us of our understanding of peace through Christ, the life that we are given, the life that we have, if it happens in our, in our, in, um, in our life, not to be redundant there, <clears throat> smooths out. It smooths out. All right? Look at this. <clears throat> Verse 2, we exalt in hope of the glory of God. Not only this, hope in the glory of God. Not only do we have, when we have this peace, this foundation of peace as well as, as grace, we are able to rejoice and be excited about the coming glory of God. Okay, so that's in the future. That's what we're looking for the future. But Paul says, that's not the only thing that you can exalt in. You're like, great, James, that's great. I can, I can look forward to the future. I can look forward to the hope that I'm having in the glory of God. And that's a great thing to be looking forward to. But look what also Paul says when you have this peace, when you have this grace, what you can also rejoice with. And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, our problems, our struggles, the strife of this world. Why? Knowing that this struggles, this problems, this strife that we have in our lives brings about perseverance. And perseverance, proven character. And proven character, hope, and hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has was given to us. 
So many of us go through this life, these tribulations, without understanding or knowing or grasping the peace that we have with God. Put that into your perspective. You have a relationship with the omnipotent God. You have a relationship with the all-knowing God. And that relationship is at peace. Jesus says, I'm going to bring you peace, not as the world brings you, but as I bring you. That peace that he was talking about is the peace that we can have with God. It is a peace that then is that fundamental, foundational in our life that allows us to look forward to God and His glory, but also look forward to day-to-day life. But so many of us respond reactively to day-to-day tribulations. We forget about the peace that's been given to us from God that we have a relationship with him. And we forget about that very thing that we so desperately need. Peace. Peace that allows us to exult in the things in which we face. Next thing I want us to know here, and we, I ta- kind of talked about it, Verse 1 again, it says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace. And so we have peace through Christ, and we have grace through Christ. I think we could stop right there and be pretty content, don't you think? Peace and grace. What is, what is our culture missing in this world today? Peace and grace. Peace. We can't find peace on the internet. We're not going to find peace in social media. We're not going to find much grace there as well. And he says, the grace which we have in which we stand. We stand in grace. That means it's continually. You know, remember we talked about this a while ago. Paul says, grace upon grace, it's never ending. It's like when grace for your situation, your trial that you just went through, then, then you're all of a sudden in now in a new one. Well, here's another dose of grace. And then you go through that trial, you go through that tribulation, you go through that, fri- that, that strife, and then God goes, okay, here's some more grace. That's the idea of grace upon grace. It's never ending. And so now we stand in this grace. Every single day, we are in, for those that are in Christ, are in his grace. We have peace and we have grace. Brethren, we desperately need those. And that's why God provided those, because his relationship to us was the most important. What's the most important thing in our life? Does it line up with God? Our life is through Christ. For to me, to live is Christ. It is through Christ. The next thing I want us to see here, drop down then to <clears throat> verse 8. Let's look at verse... Let me Actually, let me read from verse 8, just to give the, the context here. Verse 6 of uh, Romans 5, Paul says, For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For once one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God, but God, if you like to underline or or, uh, color, do that right there. Underline or box or color, but God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners... Christ died for us, much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. Again, through him we are saved. Remember, we were sinners, we were ungodly, we were enemies of God. And that's how 
much that he loved us and how much important it was to him that we had a relationship with him so that he sends his saving grace and his peace that we might be saved from that gap. Saved from <clears throat> the gap that we have brought forth to relationship in our sins. You know, as Isaiah says, that his arm is not so short that he cannot reach us, that his ear is not so dull that he can't. But it is our sins that separate us from God. It is our sins that separate us from God. Guess who can't do anything about that? We can't, we can't merit or earn or bridge that gap. How important was it to God that we had a relationship with him? He bridged that gap with his son. Through Jesus, through him, he sent his sons. While we were yet sinners, while we were yet on the receiving end of that wrath, God sent his son so that we would be saved. We'd be saved from that. Peace, grace, salvation. How much is your life? ran through Christ. How much of your life ran through Christ? I want us to notice the next thing. Let me read verse 8 again. But God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us much more than having now been just shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. Verse 10. While we were enemies... We were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Because of that distance, because of that gap, because of our sin, God sends his son while we are still enemies in order to bridge that gap that we might be saved from his wrath, but reconciled. The relationship is made right. Have you ever been in a situation, a difficult situation, where a relationship with someone is just not right? And maybe you've been the one that's tried to do what you can to make it right, and it's just not going to happen. I can't make that relationship right. And it eats at you, and it gnaws at you. This is one of those things where God wanted to make the relationship right, even though it was our fault. And so God extends, God extends grace, God extends salvation, and God extends reconciliation. He's going to make this right. I'm going to make this right. Even though you were my enemy, even though you, even though you were a sinner, even though you were ungodly, I'm going to make this right. So that you could be reconciled. The relationship made right. Brethren, think about that. How amazing is it to think that your relationship is right with God? Just think about that for a moment. Because of what Christ did, He has made your relationship right with Him. Praise God. He did that. And we just need to respond to him and say, thank you. I'll take it. I'll take it. The next thing we're going to see in Romans chapter 5 then is as a result. Verse 11, and not only this, but we also exalt in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We'll stop there and we'll finish that now. And then as a result of this, as a result of the peace that we have through Christ, as a result of the grace that we have through Christ, as a result of the salvation that we have through Christ, as a result of the reconciliation that we have been given through Christ, then we can exalt and rejoice in Christ. And then think about the emotions that we can have and what those emotions are founded on. Those emotions are founded on the peace, the grace, the salvation, the rest. That is worth rejoicing about. 
And brethren, how often do we have that peace, that grace, that salvation? Every day. For those in Christ, Paul will go on to say in Romans chapter 8, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Right? Because in Romans chapter 6, you were buried. You buried that old man and you rose up with Christ. And so now you are in Christ and you have peace. You have grace. You have salvation. You have reconciliation. And that is worth rejoicing in. See how then that is foundational to then our life? If our life is not through Christ, then it's just going to be a roller coaster type of life. Because you know all of us has been through many different things and our life is not great every day. Talk to my wife the last couple of weeks. We go through things that are very, very humbling and horrific and hard. God knew that. That's why he says, I want you to have my peace, not the peace that the world gives you. That's why I want you to have my grace. That's why I want you to have my salvation. That's why I want you to be able to be excited in the reconciliation that I offered you. Because I wanted our relationship to be right. And brethren, when your relationship is right with God, stand back. Because then he gives you the power and the strength to move forward with him leading you. And then you can go back to the first few verses in chapter 5 and you can rejoice and exalt in the tribulation and the difficulty. Because it brings strength to your relationship with God. Finally, the last thing he says here, which relates to what he says there earlier in Romans chapter 5, but Paul brings it up because it's worth bringing up again. So then look at verse 10 again. He says, For if we, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Again, this is the idea through Christ. In verse 11, And not only this, but we also exalt in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received, whom we have received the reconciliation. It is ours. The reconciliation has been offered. And for now, those who are in Christ, it has been received. We have received the right relationship with God. And that goes back to the point of what he says, in, I think more uh, kind of exagger or um, extrapolating from John 14, verse 6, where it's more about, it's more than just the exclusivity of what Jesus is saying, I am the way, the truth, the life, and no one can come to the Father except through me, but more about his ability and how he's the only one able to provide these things. It is only through Jesus that peace, grace, salvation, reconciliation, and true rejoicing can be had. And brethren, when you have that on your foundation in your life, bring on whatever Satan might bring. Bring on whatever this life may bring. Bring on whatever enemies you might have may bring you. Bring on whatever your health may happen in deterioration of our health because it happens to us all the time. Bring on anything. Because all of these things transcend and surpass Anything that we could go through. Is your life, are you living your life through Christ? Because that was God's plan. And he wants us to have that same plan in our minds and in our hearts. Are you living your life through Christ? Are you living your life through the seat of your pants? Are you living your life just kind of like day to day? I don't know what's going to happen next. You know, you just kind of have maybe a little bit of a, a, a flippant uh, perspective or attitude. God didn't plan you to have that attitude. 
God wants you to know how important you are to his life. And that's why he sent his son, so that through him we would have life abundant. What are you living your life through this morning? Is it not through Christ? Is it through your emotions? Is it through things, the physical nature? Is it through sin? Is it through a roller coaster of, of emotions, of triumphs and, and, and difficulties? And you want more stability in your life in the presence of God. Then maybe you need to return back to living your, Christ, living your life through Christ. As I already alluded to earlier, Paul says that those who are in Christ, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Those who are in Christ have the things that we just listed here in Romans chapter 5. You have peace. You have grace. You have salvation. You have, uh, you have reconciliation. You have praise and rejoicing that can happen. And you know that your relationship is right with God. God says, come to me. Be forgiven of your sins when you are immersed, when you are buried in baptism, where you die and then you are reborn again into a new life and you are added to those that are in Christ and you instantly are the recipient of these things. Please talk to someone here before we leave here. If you have anything that you're struggling with, know that the congregation is here for you to listen, to pray, to hear the things that you're struggling with, and to be the church that you need, knowing that we have the God that we need. Let us stand and let us sing. I am mine, oh. Certainly good to see everyone here this morning, especially if you're visiting with us. We hope that you'll give us the opportunity to meet you, become better acquainted with you as we conclude this morning. Uh, before we are dismissed in prayer, I did have one last announcement to make. Uh, please mark your calendars for February 5th. There will be a baby shower for Kelsey Roy's baby, uh, baby girl at the Piffner House after Sunday morning services. Any questions on that, please see Lene. Anything else we need to make mention of before we are dismissed? Yes. Just a reminder, tonight, uh, the SYD oh. concert at Inglewood, that's where uh, the elders decided that we would be uh, meeting, so there will not be uh, a meeting here tonight, so I'll be encourage you to be there for the fellowship and singing at Inglewood. Very good. All right, would you bow with me then, please? Our holy and righteous Father in heaven, we are so grateful 
that though we admit we can do nothing without you, yet with you and through your son Jesus, we can do all things, Father. We can be reconciled to you. We can have peace with you, Father. We're grateful for the fellowship that we have with you through your son Jesus. We're so grateful for the fellowship we have here at Parker with one another, again, through your son Jesus, Father. We pray that the things that have been done here have been pleasing to you and edifying to one another to build us other, each other up as we prepare to go into the world around us. And Father, as we do leave, we leave the place of comfort, the place of familiarity with those who are like-minded. We pray that you'll go with us, and if you, as you've promised to never leave us alone, that you'll be with us in all that we do. You'll keep families strong, you'll keep marriages strong, you'll keep children strong and faithful. Help us to be a light to the world around us. Help us to bring Jesus to a world that is dying in sin as someone loved us enough to bring that word to us and touched our hearts. Father, we pray that you'll be with those who are traveling, especially our, our youth as they uh, make their way back from Cheyenne today. We ask that you would be with us as we travel the path to heaven, that you would keep us safe as well. Forgive us of our sins and continue to bless and guide us that we turn not to the right hand nor to the left, but simply follow your son Jesus. We ask this in his name. Amen.